Forward. Forward. There we go. So this set of slides is not too long, but the uh, the discussion might take a while. First, we're going to look at the internal structure of the atom. How is the atom built? Um, and then we'll relate that to the periodic table. Um, a little history. In the, at the beginning of the 19th century, um, there was actually no agreed upon concept for what, it, what an element, what constituted an element. Elements were identified. They were um, uh, unique substances that could not be broken down further by any chemical means. Okay, they, they couldn't be simplified any further. Those were elements, and um, several of them have been identified through the Middle Ages. The alchemists had, had gotten some of those things right. Um, but it wasn't until uh, John Dalton came along. He was an English scientist, and he was the first one, the first experimentalist. He backed up his, his uh, pronouncements with um, experimentation. <clears throat> but uh, he proposed the uh, atomic theory, and he, and he based his theory upon an ancient Greek idea, the atom. In Greek, tomos means to cut or to divide, and anytime you have a prefix of a, it means not. So that was their idea of the atom. It couldn't be simplified any further, not cut. The Greeks, however, believed that atoms... Uh, Everything was made of the same atom. The simplest uh, particle that you could get from a substance was an atom. But they believed that everything was made of the same atom. And that's, that gave them headaches. <laughs> uh, trying to figure out how to reconcile all the different substances if they're all made of the same stuff. So they came up with various mental gyrations, you know, the four fundamental uh, elements to go along with the atom. Uh, earth, wind, fire, and water, right, and other things. Actually, you can sum it up that in opposition to John Dalton, they were not experimentalists, the ancient Greeks. They, they were all up here. So uh, they got a lot of things wrong, too. Anyway, John Dalton's atomic theory set the ball rolling. Everything's made of atoms, but he said that every element is made of a different atom. It has a simplest particle, and that was the atom for that element. And that solved the problem right, that the ancient Greeks had. But at that time, um, the atom might as well have been a jelly-filled sack. Right? They, didn't, they didn't think of it in terms of uh, structure of an atom right, made of subatomic particles that we know now. Um, so a uh, century later... Uh, electricity was starting to become really the rage, right? It was a salon party thing. Uh, you, you'd uh, get these static electric uh, generators and you'd um, everybody would hold hands in a line and then the one on the end close to the generator would touch it and everybody would jump as the charge would be transferred through the whole line. And everybody got a big giggle and, and they uh, drank some more wine. <clears throat> but J.J. Thompson identified the uh, negative particle that comes from the atom, and we identified that as the electron. Right? It's an elementary particle that's origin is in the atom. And he, he uh, J.J. Thompson, divide, was able to determine the charge to mass ratio, charge to mass ratio of the electron. He never was able to figure out how much an electron, what, what its mass was. Right, that came a little bit later with, um, let's see. Oh, we skipped somebody. We went from Thompson to Rutherford. Uh, we skipped um, um, my mind's gone blank. I'll get back to it. <laughs> <clears throat> it'll come to me in a flash when I'm not thinking about it. Anyway, uh, the mass was eventually determined by an American. 
Um, I almost had it. Uh, have you ever heard of the oil drop experiment? No? Okay. Um, anyway, <clears throat> once the electron was identified, then Ernest Rutherford, who was another um, English scientist in the beginning of the 20th century, um, was confronted with the prevailing model for the atom in those days. It was called the plum pudding model. And it was called plum pudding because the electrons were considered individual particles. And they were scattered in the atom like that. And the rest of the atom was composed of an equal but opposite charge because we knew atoms of elements were neutral. So if we knew that there was an electron there, then there had to be something balancing the charge. They knew, they at least knew that much. But we didn't consider it a particle at the time. We thought it was just part of the matrix, the pudding. And the pieces of plum were the electrons. So Ernest Rutherford says, said to himself, I'm, I'm uh, channeling Ernest. <laughs> he said, said to himself, this is stupid. That doesn't make any sense. And, and I'm going to prove that it's wrong. So his model was the nuclear model. He thought that there was a particle with an opposite charge on it. But he also knew that once we had the mass of the electron, that accounted for just a small fraction of the mass of the atom. Right? It says there has to be something heavier in there. And he said, OK, I think that we've got a nucleus here with positive charges, uh, particles in it, right? however many. And then the electrons are out here in this empty space. And this is where most of the mass is concentrated in the nucleus. So uh, he devised an experiment that would prove his point. Rather than plum pudding, he thought the nuclear model was better. So he said, all right, uh, at, at the same time, uh, radioactivity had been developed and uh, radioactive decay of some elements was being identified and the particles that come out of those decays were in the nature of um, alpha particles, right? which turned out to be um, helium nuclei, right? just stripped of their electrons. Right? Have we done this yet? We haven't done that yet. Okay, it's coming. <laughs> uh, hold on to your horses. So the, the alpha particle was, was very heavy and um, uh, lots of radioactive elements decayed in that form, and they gave off these helium nuclei, and it's flying out. Uh, then there were the uh, beta particles, which are essentially electrons, and then there was gamma, which was is light, high energy light. So this is what Rutherford was actually working on: alpha emissions. Uh, his team. So he had access to alpha emitters. So he thought to himself. If I fire those things at a very thin something, he needed something that was very thin, it was just a couple or three, four atoms thick, then if the plum pudding model is correct, then those alpha particles will fly straight through it without being stopped, and they'll all form a nice little dot on the other side. But if my model is correct, then most of them will go through this empty space, right, like that, but some of them will like hit like that and bounce back. Some of them will be deflected. Some of them will come in here like this, and then the electrons will cause them to deflect. So you'll get a pattern where you have most of them in this bright dot, but then you'll have the others scattered. All you need is a detector, some type of detector to pick it up. So uh, Rutherford conducted his experiment and proved his model, and the plum pudding model is dead. And then um, I won't go into too much detail here. Niels Bohr, um, once we ha had identified the uh, major particles in the nuclear atom, we still haven't done the neutron yet. Right? The neutron is about the same weight as a proton, but it doesn't have a charge. And the reason that they went looking for it was not even the protons accounted for all the mass of the atom. So Rutherford got one of his uh, students, a guy by the name of Chadwick, 
set him on the problem, and he discovered the neutron and characterized it and all that. Uh, Rutherford got a Nobel Prize for his work. Chadwick got a Nobel Prize for his work. And then, uh, then along came Niels Bohr, who was a, a Danish physicist, and he proposed the planetary model. So these electrons are moving in orbits around the nucleus. They're actually not, but for the time, it was it was an advance. And then along came uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who was a uh, German. And he proposed what became the uh, quantum theory, quantum mechanics. And now that's what we actually believe is going on in the atom is these electrons are not really particles. They're they are waves. In, in certain energy levels outside the nucleus. OK, that's the short version. OK, so now we know that the atom is made up of um, electrons, protons and neutrons. And um, the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, the electrons are out here. So if you stop and think about it, if we're going to uh, put atoms together into various compounds, when they come together, what do they see first? They see electrons first. And they see the, the orbitals that electrons occupy. That's where the chemistry happens with the electrons. OK, and here's a and it gives you an idea of the relative mass. If um, if the electron is a mass of one and the proton is about eighteen hundred times uh, and the neutron, both about eighteen hundred times as, as massive. OK, so there's the nucleus. It's very dense with uh, all these positive charges and neutrons are packed together. And um, except for uh, one isotope of hydrogen, which only has one proton and one electron. Right, so it doesn't have any neutrons. But deuterium has one neutron and tritium has three, has two neutrons. So uh, and they're particularly valuable for uh, fusion energy. We're getting close. In fact, I heard the other day that um, one, I think it was Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, had uh, created more energy from fusion than it took to, to cause the reaction. So that's a step in the right direction. Okay. So um, let me, uh, I think there's a slide on it, but I think it's, it's, it's time for a, so that I can Is everybody memorizing their symbols? Got your symbols memorized? Okay. When we write a symbol, there are four positions around that symbol that are reserved for certain types of information. Right? I'm going to use just an X. Right? So there's your symbol. Uh, up here, if there's nothing there, that means it's neutral. If you have a, a charge, uh, then you put the charge with its negative or positive and the number. Okay. Uh, if you have uh, different numbers of atoms in the molecule or in the compound, that's where you put the subscript. Okay. So uh, naturally occurring at room temperature and, and pressure, hydrogen would be written like this because there are two of them. And those diatomic elements that I mentioned um, in the first lecture, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, those are all diatomics. So at room temperature and pressure, they're going to be written as two atoms hooked together. Okay, so we got charge, number of atoms. Here, designated by Z, is the atomic number. This is the number of protons in that atom. And this is specific for the element. If you know the number of protons, you can find the element in your periodic table. If you know the symbol, then you know the number of protons. If you try to change the, the if you make an ion, you make an ion by adding or subtracting electrons. Because if you change this value, you've got a different element. Okay, so you leave the protons alone, unless you're transmuting them. And up here, designated by A is the mass number. 
let's see, this is the atomic number. This is the mass number. And the mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay. So if you have this value and you have that value, you can find out how many neutrons. You just subtract Z from A, and you know how many neutrons you have in that particular um, atom. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay. I knew it was in there somewhere. There's my symbol. Okay. And there's an example of sodium. There's only one sodium atom and it's neutral, right? So there's there's nothing on the right hand side, but you have 11 protons. And if you look on the periodic table on that one, the atomic number is in the lower left hand in red. And so sodium is 11, magnesium is 12, hydrogen is one, argon's 18, whatever the case may be. And then with a mass number of 23, how many neutrons does it have? 12. Yeah. 11 plus 12 is 23. Okay. Let's see. Element. Uh, we defined an element earlier. This is just a reminder. It's a pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler pure substances by chemical means. And those could be things like um, electricity, heat, light, various types of anything that would break bonds. Um, now we know why substances are pure. Right? Uh, elements are pure because they're all composed of the same atom. At least an atom with the same number of protons. Right? We haven't got to isotopes yet. I think that's coming. And they all possess the same chemical properties. Now for isotopes, uh, this is this is one type of atom that Dalton didn't consider. Um, and it, it's understandable because they didn't know about subatomic particles. They didn't know about protons, electrons, and neutrons. But an isotope of um, sodium with 11 and 23, um, if we add another neutron, what's the mass number going to be now? 24. Okay. So it's got a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. So it's the same element. It just has a different mass for that atom. Um, the chemical properties are virtually identical. Because it has the same number of protons, it means it has the same number of electrons in the same energy levels. And they behave similarly, chemically speaking, because of those electrons. But we can separate them because they have different masses. Right? We, they have different physical properties. They're slightly different. And it wasn't until the development of the mass spectrometer that we could uh, easily separate them. Right? Uh, I don't think we have time to go into the mechanics of the mass spectrometer, but just as a, a one sentence explanation, it's a device that separates atoms based upon their masses. And that in bold is true. Most elements found in nature exist in as several isotopes. So if this one has uh, a mass of 23 and that one has a mass of 24, if you have equal amounts in your sample, then the total, I mean, the, the average mass of the two would be like 23 and a half. Okay. But it's, it rarely occurs that way. Most of the time, one, of, one isotope is dominant and the others are minor. But it's enough to skew the value that you see on the periodic table. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner of each one of those squares is the, not the mass number, but the atomic mass. And that's a weighted average of all the isotopes right, that are naturally occurring for that element. Right? 
everybody knows how to calculate the grade point average, right? Okay. So if you if you get an A, it's worth four points, right? In the course. And if the course is worth uh, four credit hours, that's four times four is 16 as a value of 16. And if you take a, a separate course that may be only two hours and you get an A in that one, that's only worth eight. So it doesn't carry as much weight. That's what we're talking about, weighted average. So all those um, high credit hour courses, you want to get all those A's. And then the rest of them, you can you can slip a little bit and maybe make a B in a couple of them. Okay. Um, okay, silicon here is our example, and it, it just... The notation here is that the number of protons have to be the same if it's the same element. The mass numbers are different, so the number of neutrons are different. And these are both neutral atoms. Okay, so let's say we have an isotope with 23 protons. Let's see, let me make room here. 23 protons. protons and 28 neutrons all right uh, what's the mass number of the element well, 51 right that's equal to the mass number just add them together what's the element right. if it's got 23 protons we just look from upper left to lower right and work our way down until we find 23 all right. Can you see it from there? I don't know. I, did I have you memorize that one? I think I did. It's vanadium with 23 and 51. Okay. All right. Now we'll get into we're going to get into the weeds now on atomic masses. The reported values in the periodic table are weighted averages. But in order to uh, discuss these values intelligently, one scientist to another, we need to have a, an agreed upon standard. And the standard that has been chosen recently. Let me shut this off. Actually, the standard used to be uh, oxygen, oxygen 16. Uh, but it was found that oxygen was difficult to handle. Right? So why do, what do I mean by standard? I mean that whatever standard we pick, we set its mass at a value. Right? We just, not arbitrarily, but it, it's, um, now it's carbon. All right, so let's, let's move to carbon. The reason it was oxygen first, because most metals in the Earth's crust are combined with oxygen. Right? There are only a few that are not, like gold. And even gold combines with oxygen sometimes. But now we, we choose carbon, and we choose the isotope carbon-12 as our standard. Okay, One reason it's, it's standard is it's very easy to obtain. All you need is some organic material ash it, separate the carbon, and uh, then run it through your mass spectrometer and you can separate the isotopes. <clears throat> so it's easy to obtain and standardize. So this is set at 12, however many dots you need, 12 atomic mass units. Okay, that's where we're starting. 12 atomic mass units is that isotope of carbon. Everything else is compared to that. So none of the other isotopes are going to have an atomic mass that is a whole number. They're all going to be fractions, decimal fractions. Um, but for simplicity's sake, uh, in this slide, we're going we're gonna to do a calculation based upon carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. And we're going to assume that thirteen carbon-13 is 13 atomic mass units and carbon-14 is 14. Now we know in the back of our minds that it's not exactly 
right? Because this is the only one that is 12 with infinite zeros. But for argument's sake, we're going to do a calculation with uh, carbon 12 in uh, naturally occurring carbon 12 uh, near the Earth is 98.89%. Right? Most of it is carbon 12. There's a carbon 13 at 1.11%. And then carbon-14 is less than a, a hundredth of a percent. There are some other isotopes of carbon, but they're even less than carbon-14. Right, so what's unique about carbon-14? Why is it so small? Because it's radioactive, right? It decays, right? Within a certain amount of time, after you make carbon-14, uh, it, it's gone. So that's probably why it's such a low percentage. Carbon-14 is... Um, they tell me most of it is manufactured by the interaction of uh, other carbon isotopes with ultraviolet light. Anyway, uh, so it's such a small amount, we really only need to consider the first one and the second one uh, to get a good idea of what the average atomic mass of carbon, of carbon, naturally occurring carbon, and that's the value we put in the periodic table. Right? It, it's a nice thing, right? Periodic table has these values already calculated for us. We don't have to worry about the isotopes, right? If we want to do chemistry, we just use those values. And the mix has already been, uh, been factored in. Okay, so let me see. Uh, are we, do we have a calculation? Yeah, we do have a calculation. All right. So if we go to the calculation, we find that 98% uh, of the mass value is going to be due to uh, 12 atomic mass units from carbon 12. Now this is a little misleading. You don't multiply percent times something. You actually multiply the fractional equivalent of percent, which would be 0.9889. So 0.9889, well, oh, there it is. I can look at my own slide. Uh, times 12 plus 0 0.0111, which is the equivalent of percent, the decimal equivalent of percent, times 13 point, oh, we're actually using the, the true value. Oh, that's good, yeah. The true value of carbon 13, its mass is 13.0034 atomic units, okay? So it only contributes that very small amount, but it's enough so that the average is 12.01. Okay, does everybody see that? Okay. That's where those values come from. So there's a difference between mass units, uh, um, atomic mass, and mass, uh, and the summation of neutrons and protons. Okay, so if we have an element consisting of 62.6% of an isotope with a mass of 186.956 and 37% of an isotope with a mass of 184.953, what's the average atomic mass? And then identify the element. So let's do that. I don't think I have it animated. Oops, I do have the answer though. <laughs> okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna take one, uh, 186.956 and its contribution is 0.6260 okay and then the other isotope is 184.953 times 0 0.3740 there we go. So we get values for each one of those. All right? Anybody beat me to the calculation? This one is I'll keep some extra decimals to avoid rounding error. And then 184.953 times 0 0.374. And this one is 
0.17242. So we, now we add those together. 7, 8, 5. Oh, I didn't line them up right, did I? Let's do this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Try that again. Now this is 9. That's 6, 2, and this is 16, and 1 to 7 is 8. 186.2069 atomic mass units is the average uh, atomic mass considering those two isotopes. Okay. Um, now, how do we use that to find out what element is? Well, we use the technique that scientists had to use before they knew about atomic numbers, before they knew about um, the association of atomic number and the element identity, right? And you'll notice that those values, they're kind of small to read from there, but if you got a copy of the periodic table, you can see they get bigger as you go down and from left to right. So you just follow along until you find something close to that. 186.2069, I have to get closer. So let's see, that one looks really close. So this is 183 and then it's 190. This is 186.207. So our element is rhenium. Right? And rhenium has an atomic number of 75. Now we can't put anything up here because we're representing this as a weighted average. Okay, so um, it's this isotope and that isotope, so we can't put the number there, the mass number. Okay. There's rhenium. So, uh, aside from the fact that this is a, an exercise in calculating the average atomic mass for an element, um, it's also an exercise in showing that you, if you know the atomic mass of an unknown, you can usually find out what it is based upon its mass and not just the atomic number. Now, there, there are places in the periodic table, not many of them, but places where the, uh, mass not, the atomic masses are very close together. So it might be difficult in those cases to determine which one's which. In fact, some places they reverse. You're going along um, uh, one, two, three, six, Five, right? it, it switches. You can thank um, Mendeleev for that one. We'll talk about him in a minute. Okay. Um, isotopes, different number of neutrons. Now, wh why do we even need neutrons in the atom anyway? You ever thought about that? Probably not, because you were just introduced to them, right? <laughs> I'm sorry? You're very close. The theory is now that um, you've got all these protons packed into this tight ball, and you know, like charges repel one another, don't they? Right? So they think the neutrons are in there to stabilize the nucleus and allow those positive charges to remain in that tight ball. So it's kind of like a phosphor. Yeah, actually, it's a it's an exchange medium. Okay. They think that there's a particle that is exchanged from neutron to proton, and it changes this proton into a neutron and leaves the proton behind. Um, and they think that maybe that, that particle is the source of the, uh, well, I erased it, the beta particle, the electron. Uh, because they are different in mass. The neutron is a little bit heavier than the proton. And then uh, another way to explain it is just say, well, there's the strong nuclear force and let it go with that. <laughs> it holds them together. <clears throat> okay, periodic table, right? We see that the periodic table, uh, the most commonly used one, it takes that form where it's kind of high on the ends and drapes in the middle. And then it has those two rows at the bottom that are actually supposed to fit right in here, right? This one's supposed to fit right there. This one's supposed to fit right there. 
But if we did that, the table would be like twice as wide. Uh, and it would not be as easy to derive um, atomic structure information from the table. Now, that's that's a, a cryptic statement, but it's true. And once we figure out uh, how atoms are built, you know, one proton at a time with its electron, right? We just add a proton, we get a new element. And add an electron comes along with it, and we keep building them up. Uh, and where those electrons go in their positions around the atom is um, is a, a clue. Actually, the clue is in the table as to where they go. Right, we'll get there. First, the periodic law. So you see the table is arranged in, it's, it's, like, it's like a regular table. It's like columns and it's like a, an Excel spreadsheet, right? Uh, columns and rows. Well, the periodic law simply says that when we arrange elements uh, according to their atomic number, then we go left to right and they get the atomic number gets bigger from left to right. But we also have the columns or groups and the groups have similar chemical characteristics, right? Uh, that first column is alkali metals. Those are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Um, has anybody done their uh, periodic table free uh, the um, extra credit exercise yet? I did hand that out, didn't I? Okay. So you got these groups, some of them have names, like that first one is alkaline metals. The second one with beryllium at the top is alkaline earths or alkaline earth metals. And then you got this group in the middle, the transition elements. And then you get over to on the right hand side, you got the noble gases. Right to the left of them are the halogens. And the left of them are the calcogens, the oxygen group. And then next to them are the nictogens, the nitrogen group. And they all have similar characteristics, particularly those in the first two columns and the last six and when you get into the transition elements things kind of get muddy but as, as long as you stay on the two left and the six right those are called the representative elements um, the the groups are fairly consistent in their chemical behavior okay so when um, Mendeleev and some of his associates were trying to to put these elements in a, a uh, a usable form in a table of sorts. Um, Mendeleev in particular was basing his arrangement of the elements based upon those common characteristics. So you would have one in, you would go across from left to right, adding a proton as you go, and you get down to say, um, you're down to chlorine and you go to argon, and you go beyond argon would be 19 protons. Well, 19 means it's potassium. But if we stick potassium out there by itself, it's in a group of its own, but it has similar characteristics to the alkali metals. So why not just wrap around and start a new row? And that's what they do. They just start a new row based upon those similar, similar characteristics. And that's called uh, the period, the period from left to right, because you wrap around. Has anybody had physics in this class? You ever been introduced to periodic motion? Have you ever heard of that? Okay. Think of a clock, a grandfather clock with a swinging pendulum. That's periodic motion, right? The pendulum's moving, right? But it doesn't go anywhere, right? It's just out here, back here, back here. It always ends up in the same place. It's moving, but it goes through a period to get back to where it started. And that's the idea here. We're going down a row. And instead of falling off the end, we start another row. That's a period. And that essentially is the periodic law. And the periodic table I've described already the way it's arranged in, in columns, periods, and groups. Okay, who gets credit? Well, um, it was a sort of a collaborative effort, so to speak. 
which is most of science, actually. Modern science. Medieval science was, was more like, well, they were alchemists. They were more like uh, glorified cooks. Right? And they had uh, apprentices that they, they passed on their recipes to. <clears throat> but in modern science, the whole idea is to gain knowledge um, using a method that weeds out falsehoods. And one of the ways to weed them out is to go under peer review. So if you try to publish something, then there are all these other people that are working in the same area and they say, you're, you're full of kimchi. Right? <laughs> Your theory is, is worthless, right? Show me the data. Right? So essentially that's peer review. Um, so Doberiner uh, noticed similarities of uh, elements that were came in threes. He called them the triads. So things like lithium, sodium, potassium had similar characteristics. And things like fluorine, chlorine, and bromine, they were similar in their chemical characteristics. And he had this list of, of triads, but he didn't do anything with it. I mean, he stopped there. Right. And then came along um, Meyer. And uh, he set up his table based upon their reactivity. They call it valency. Uh now, I don't have a lot of details for that, but he put them together in a table, but um, he he didn't use the table to do anything substantial. Right? It just organized the elements uh, according to their valency. And now we know that the valency is uh, uh, similar to the groups. Right? So the halogens have a valence of minus one and the alkali metals have a valence of plus one. It wasn't until, I think, our next guy, Mendeleev, came along. He, he was Russian, and he took uh, these similar characteristics and put them in a table. In fact, his first table was actually rotated 90 degrees from the one we see now. Right? So his, his periods were up and down, and his groups were left to right. His second publication rotated them into the position we see now. What Mendeleev did was he put things in the positions in their groups based upon their physical and chemical characteristics. And he relied less upon their masses. They did know masses at the time. They just weren't too sure about right, what those masses represented. And when it came to a position in the table where uh, if you were uh, progressive with the masses and put an element here and here, then they didn't match their groups in their characteristics. Well, he just switched them. He says, no, this is supposed to be over here because it's in the, it's has those characteristics. And it, later he was proven to be right. He also had gaps in his table where he didn't, there was no discovered element that would fit those group characteristics. So he left them blank. And not only that, he took the knowledge he had of the other groups and what the expected behavior would be for that unknown element and said, it's going to be uh, this weight and it's going to have these physical and chemical characteristics. He predicted. And sure enough, they found them. Right. Probably, well, I don't know for sure, but uh, if he predicted them, then there might have been some graduate student out there that says, OK, I'm going to go find that one. And, and they did. And that's why Mendeleev gets the lion's share of the credit for the periodic table, even though all these other people sort of fed into it. <clears throat> it's because of its predictive ability. Uh, then then along came. So uh, at the time of Mendeleev, what we knew about the elements and their positions was based only on their atomic weights. And these, and some of them were wrong. Um, because they didn't, they didn't understand, um, not isotopes, but they didn't understand um, uh, numbers of atoms, right? How many does it take to make this weight? Um, 
I don't want to, I can't go into detail right now for that one. Uh, cause it'll, we'll go off on a wild tangent. So let's stick to the next one in the line. Henry Mosley, he was an Englishman and he was working on X-ray spectroscopy of primarily metals. So he had this device that he had built and he put metals in and fired X-rays at them. And then he, he ran the light that came off of, of the, uh, excited atoms of that metal and ran it through a spectrometer and spread it into its individual uh, lines. And his detectors were calibrated so that he knew exactly what the number was for, for that wavelength of light or frequency, as the case may be. And what he noticed was that in a formula that could predict the wavelength of that X-ray coming off of the metal, he was able to predict um, for each element what that wavelength would be by just changing one value in the formula. And they were always whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Well, not one because that'd be hydrogen. But um, all he had to do was increment by one whole number and he could get the wavelength for the next element. That's, that's all that he associated with them. We recognized later that what he was actually giving us was the atomic number for that element, the number of protons. Unfortunately, uh, Henry Mosley did his work in 1913 and the First World War broke out in 1914. And he was a patriotic Brit. So he enlisted and went off to war. And he, because of his science background, he was a communications officer. And he was assigned to a group that was uh, attacking a uh, position in Turkey, famous one called Gallipoli. And everybody, uh, every history, if you've got any, uh, if you got a favorite history teacher, ask them this one. You know, what happened at Gallipoli? <laughs> well, the British got their asses kicked. And a lot of people died, including Henry Mosley. So that was the end of his career right there. Okay. Um, so I've discussed the periods and the groups and their special names. Those are, those are all the names that I've given you so far. And those Roman numerals to the right of each of those names represent that it, it's associated with the valence of the elements in that group. Um, now we, and, and that particular table up there has both systems, the modern system and this older system. The older system is nice because as long as it, the Roman numeral is followed by an A, you're either in the left hand, two left hand columns or the right six hand, uh, the right hand six columns. And what they, what they are telling you, those Roman numerals are telling you is this is the valence number for that column. Right. The far left one has a valence number of one. That means it has one electron that can be given up. And that's why they're all in that column. They're all positive, one positive charge. The next one has a Roman numeral two. They have two electrons they can give up. Right. They're metals. Metals like to give up electrons. So when they form a, a compound with a nonmetal, they will have a two plus charge because they give up those two electrons to the nonmetal. And if you go keep going across, you saw boron is three, right? It has three electrons to give up. Uh, carbon has four electrons. And based upon something that we haven't discussed yet, <laughs> it could either give up those four electrons or give up one or two of them, or it could accept four electrons, right? Have you had a discussion in any of your other science courses called the octet, the octet rule? No? Okay, this is all new then. <clears throat> we'll get to it. Um, nitrogen is a nonmetal with um, five, excuse me, brain seizure. I feel like Mitch McConnell. Um, has five electrons. Well, rather than giving up five, uh, it would rather accept three. So it accepts three electrons from some other metal and it's happy. Um, oxygen has six, so it, it wants to accept two. 
and the halogens have seven, so they want to accept one. And the noble gas has eight, and they don't play with anybody, right? Inert gases, they don't form compounds unless you force them. And uh, helium, neon, the, no compounds have ever been formed with them. But maybe one or two with argon and many more with krypton and xenon, have we've actually forced them to form compounds. And it's, it's a complex discussion that we're not prepared to do right now. Okay, so there's an example of the table. I know the, the print's too small, but what I wanted to point out first was that black line. Right? When you do that extra credit, you, it asks you to draw the black line in there, right? To differentiate between non-metals on the right and metals on the left. So most of the periodic table is metals. And they have common characteristics. Like if you if you have a chunk of, of uh, metal and you polish it, it'll have a luster. It'll shine. Um, or if you have the pure element of any of those metals, most of them, you can uh, mold them. Right? They're very soft. Uh, in fact, uh, pure iron, we think of iron as tough, right? Well, pure iron, you can scratch it with your fingernail. Uh, so they're malleable, they're ductile, you can stretch them into wires. Um, uh, whereas, and they're, most of them, except for one, at room temperature is solid. Got any idea of which one is liquid at room temperature? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Mercury. That's why mercury is so valuable, because they conduct electricity, they conduct heat. So when you have an uh, electric light switch, very often they've got a little... A capsule of mercury in there and they got a, a lead a wire on either side and if you flip the switch a certain way it causes the mercury to make the contact and if you flip it the other way the mercury rolls away and breaks the circuit but as long as they stay in that device there's it's safe i mean if you take the capsule out and break it of course you've got mercury everywhere um thermostats right in your your furnace or your air conditioning system uh, lots of times they will have mercury switches in them, too. Um, OK, so that's characteristic metals. Non-metals, on the other hand, can be any three of the phases, solid, liquid or gas. All right, we've got examples of gases up there. We've got examples of liquids. Uh, bromine is a liquid at room temperature. Uh, iodine, another halogen, is a solid at room temperature. Um, sulfur, phosphorus, selenium, arsenic. The heavier ones are solids. Carbon's a solid at room temperature. Boron's a solid at room temperature. Silicon, they're all solids at room temperature. But you can have a mix. You have different ones, whereas metals are, are mostly solids. Okay. So we increase the atomic number from one element to the next, increment by one, and you get the next element in the series. Uh, they're... they're uh, Characteristics of the metals, I mentioned them already. Right? They're just there for posterity's sake. Non-metals, on the other hand, are, they can be uh, any one of these. And they're usually, uh, if they're solids, then they'll be brittle. Right? They're, they're easily broken. And there's a, a list of the comparisons. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that because you can read it yourself. Okay, there's your dividing line, and let's see. I need to keep track of this in my uh, in my hard copy. I'm doing on time. About an hour and twenty minutes from done. Uh, let's see. Okay, it doesn't mention it. Okay, I'm going to mention it. Uh, elements that are close to that line, like. Particularly psyllium, uh, silicon, germanium, arsenic, anibot, excuse me, antimony, tellurium. They are what's called um, metalloids. And they behave as metals in some situations and nonmetals in others. They, they kind of bridge the gap. And uh, silicon is probably the most important one of all because. One word, semiconductors, computer chips, right? 
Silicon forms the basis of the semiconductor industry. Not, it's not the only one that could do that, right? Um, but it's the cheapest one. So all of our computer chips are, are based upon silicon as the substrate, and then we do things to it to make, to make the microcircuits, switches. <clears throat> we actually, um, pure silicon, and it has to be very pure. So um, you can go on the uh, internet or YouTube and call up a, a video of, of uh, the uh, creation of a silicon ingot, they call it. They grow a silicon, uh, a big silicon crystal that's about that big around, and it's about 10, 12 feet long. And it takes a while to do it, but it's extremely pure. And then they slice it right into these big these round circles and they they uh, uh, use various techniques to uh, build up the circuits on that surface and one of the ways they do it is to dope it right they either add thing they may add uh, oh I don't know germanium or a phosphorus depending on whether they want it to be a a, 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 a P semiconductor or an N semiconductor uh, maybe we'll talk about that later, but um, they have different, you can modify its conductivity. And then when you put those two together, you can form uh, an interface that acts as a gate. So if you're interested in that, there's plenty of literature out there on it. That's, that's beyond me at the moment. Okay, difference between metals and non-metals. All of those are differences. Electrical conductivity, uh, uh, phases that they can occupy, malleability versus brittle. Okay, now we're going to dip our toes into the quantum mechanics pond. Let's see. Okay, that's clear. Um, and talk about building atoms, uh, one proton and one electron at a time. Where do they go? Well, we're not too worried about the proton. It just goes into the nucleus and it forms the positive charge that balances the electron that you put out here. We're more interested in the electrons. Where do they go? Because that's where the chemistry happens. So the first level is called the electron shell. And it's related to energy, energy levels. The further away the shell is from the nucleus, the higher the energy. OK, and we base that upon a, a practical approach, because if you have an electron here and you want to promote it to a uh, higher energy, add energy to it, it's going to jump to further from the nucleus until if you add enough energy, it completely goes separate. You form the ion. OK, and for that one, we designate it with an N, which is the principal quantum number. OK, that one um, we owe to Niels Bohr when he was working with his uh, planetary model. Right? And he said the uh, his planetary model says nucleus is here and you've got these orbitals here. One, two, three on up. And the electrons are here. And he said, um, when you add energy to that electron, if it's not enough, it'll stay put. If it's just right, it'll go to the next level. Or if you put it even more into it, it's exactly the right amount, it'll go to that level. Okay, this is called the quantum approach. A quantum of energy is enough to go from here to here. Too little, won't move. Um, so that's what the N is. And they're all whole numbers starting with one. One, two, three, all that. OK. All right. The next level is um, the angular momentum quantum number, which is L. I'm going to come over here because I need more room. Equals the angular uh, momentum quantum number. OK, this one. Uh, references 
the shape. This has this designates primarily the shape of the region of space that the electron occupies. Now, uh, I need to qualify anything I say from now on. We don't know where electrons are. Uh, it's based upon a, a principle that was promulgated by a guy by the name of Heisenberg, uncertainty principle. And basically what, what it says is, uh, if you identify where something is, you can't know anything about how fast it's moving. But if you identify how fast it's moving or its energy, then you can't identify where it is. So if we focus on the energies here, then we can't know where the electrons are. <laughs> and as it turns out, the energies are more important. Uh, we What we want is a region of space where they might be. And that's what we're talking about here. The shape of the orbital tells us roughly uh, the region of area that the electron is located and it's based upon probability. Right? Quantum, when you hear the term quantum mechanics, always think probability because we never know for sure. It's just the most probable. So these are based upon each one of these numbers right here. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know what you call it, a, a series expansion, an expansion series. If it's one, this one always starts with, I think, uh, zero. Right. So um, you can have as many L's in each one of these ends as there are numbers here. So we say um, the N minus one is the first one. Right. So at this N equals one, you can only have one of these. That's it. One of these shapes. But if you have n equals two, right? n equals two, then you can have a zero and a one. You have two possibilities for two. And for three, you can have zero, one, and two. Okay? Now, uh, let me let me keep going uh, one more. Let's see, if we have a four, then you can have a zero, one, two, and a three. Okay, for convenience, we assign letters to these numbers of the L's. And that's what that slide tells you. The, this zero, we assign an S. So there's another S here. And this one is a P. So we have an S, an S, a P. This one's a D. And this one is an S, P, D, and F. And that's as far as we need to go, right? For all, for the 118 elements that we know now, that's as far as you need to go for neutral atoms, right? Only when you're exciting them and you're moving the electrons into further away would you have to go to, to G's and, and higher. Okay, so we've got these are energy. These are shape. Um, just for argument's sake, the s orbitals are spherical in three dimensional space. The p orbitals are kind of dumbbell shaped like that. And the d's, uh, they get ridiculous. Right? <laughs> and all of these shapes are mathematical calculations based upon Schrodinger's equations. I think, yeah, Schrodinger. Uh, so we actually haven't observed them. Right. These are probability distributions that are mathematically produced. So why do we believe that they exist and we can't see them? Well, because when we use them to explain things about atoms and compounds and so forth, this works the best of all, of all the theories. Okay. Uh, okay, so we got N, L, then we got M sub L. And you may have guessed that M sub L is derived from these. Okay. M sub L is, um, let me see what the proper name is, magnetic quantum number. Magnetic quantum number. This one is derived from each one of these. And it's based upon 
uh, negative L to positive L by single uh, digit increments. So for zero, you can only have that one right, for this one. If you have a one, if, if the L is equal to zero, you can only have that one. That's it. If L is equal to one, you can have a minus one, a zero, and a plus one. Right, so you can have three. The P uh, subshell. Let me see. I want to use. I'm going to use their. Yeah, I want to use their terminology. This is the shell. This is the subshell. And this is the orbital. That's the way your authors referred to them. Shell, subshell, orbital. You can have three orbitals in this subshell. If we went to two, what would we have? <laughs> minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Okay. I know that I can see head spinning already. The reason I want to go into this much detail is because this explains why the table is arranged the way it is. And then with this, we're able to build atoms, one proton, one electron at a time. Okay. What they don't give you here is the last one. There are four quantum numbers that are unique to every electron. And you cannot have two electrons with the same set of four quantum numbers. So you're going to have one, two, three. So the fourth one is M sub S. This is the simplest one. It's either a plus one half or a minus one half. And this refers to the spin. The spin um, assumes that the electron behaves as a little uh, spinning top, right? Plus one half will go this direction and the minus one half will go this direction. Right? So each one of these orbitals can have two electrons in it with opposite spins. Okay? So let's say we had um, we had an electron uh, with, say, a plus one half spin and it was in the plus one uh, M sub L, that means it would be from a two. Uh, it doesn't have to be from a two, it could be from a one. Let's say it is from a two. And that two comes from this one, number three. So it'd be a three, two, plus one, plus one half, would be its four quantum numbers. Now, what we really want to do is use that information to do something with it. How they came up with these numbers, don't ask me. That's way beyond me. But we can decide how many orbitals are available uh, of the different uh, subshells. Right. The number of orbitals for S, right, since S is zero, the number of orbitals is only one. It can only have uh, M sub L equals one. Right, so this would be uh, M sub L would be here, right, zero. You can only have one. The P orbitals, or the ones here, can have three. So that's what that table is showing you. You can have three orbitals in a P subshell. You can have five in a D subshell. Right, because D is two, so two, one, two, three, four, five. And how about three? We didn't do that one yet. Three can have seven. You have minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three. So you can have seven orbitals. That means with two electrons each, you can have a maximum of 14 electrons accounted for and their protons as you build atoms. Notice how the periodic table is structured. Right? For the S, you can have two right. with a, one spin one way and one spin the other way. One, two, ten. Okay. For the, uh, the P orbitals, you can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Oh, excuse me. You can have, uh, excuse me, S. You can have one, two, and then for the P, you can have six. 
Am I consistent? Yeah. P is three was two electrons each is six electrons. So six electrons accounts for this. Two electrons for the S account for that. Two electrons S here, six there. Okay, so these are all uh, S orbital filling, those two groups. Right? There's just two of them, right? plus one half, minus one half for S orbital. These are all P orbital filling. These are all D orbital filling, right? If D's can have five orbitals with two electrons each, that means you can have 10 elements, right? 10 protons and electrons as you, as you build. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So everything in here is filling D orbitals, except for right there. We'll leave that out. How many you think are here? Seven. Times two is 14, right? You're going to have 14 or here. So this is S orbital filling, P orbital filling, D orbitals, and F orbitals. That's the arrangement of the periodic tables. Okay. And there are some examples of shapes. Right? There's the S orbital spherical. P orbitals are kind of dumbbells, but there are three of them. Right? There are three dumbbell shapes. So if you can have three dumbbell shapes with a minus one, zero, plus one, they would look like this, right? On a three-dimensional, right, X, Y, Z, you would have maybe one like that, one like this, and then one into and out of the board, okay? And D orbitals, they're really messy, <laughs> right? You need, uh, uh, you need five shapes there. So you can have, they actually form their lobes between the axes. And you can have five of them. Well, four of them are, are okay. Right? They look fairly normal. But the fifth one is kind of like a, a, a toroid, a donut. And then F is even, is, goes from sublime to ridiculous. Okay, uh, there's P orbitals, right? On axis in, in three different directions. And there's your spins. Okay, so we got shells, subshells, and orbitals, according to your textbook. Now, these are some of the principles that were that have been developed and um, govern how we can build atoms. The Aufbau principle. Aufbau is a German word. I don't speak German. I just have to take their word for it. It's just. It's like um, um, Aufbau means do it this way. <laughs> Actually, what it means is as you build the atom, the next, add one more proton, the next electron in the neutral atom goes into the lowest possible energy level that's available. Right? So you've got them in here, then the next one out here, and you just keep building that way. That's what Aufbau principle means. Actually, that's the simplest one. Um, Let's go to the three. Let's go to the Pauli exclusion principle first, because I've mentioned it already. Uh, no two electrons can have the same quantum set of four quantum numbers. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. In other words, if you've got, if you claim that your atom has uh, two or more electrons and they have the same set of four, then you're wrong. It can't, it can't happen. They have to have unique sets of quantum numbers. Now, basically, uh, the short version is those numbers, those quantum numbers go into uh, Schrodinger's equations and they spit out information that you that depending on the equation, they spit out information that you need to know about the electron in that orbital. Then back to Hun's rule. Hun's rule simply says that if you're building your atom and you have uh, Let's say you have a one that needs a p orbital, right? And you've got these three. You've got these three, or uh, actually a p subshell. These three orbitals, these three p orbitals, uh, that sometimes I call them uh, p x, p y, and p z, right? because of the axes that they're oriented on. 
Well, how many electrons can you put in there? A total of six, right? Are available, right? Spin up, spin down. Well, what Hun's rule says is, as you're building your atom, if you've got, say, uh, four electrons to go into that, that uh, set of orbitals, you have to do it one at a time in separate orbitals before you can go back and start pairing them up. So with four, we'd do three this way and one there. You couldn't do two here and two here, right, and leave one empty. That's against the rules. Um, and if you think about it logically, right, what are these electrons going to do? Well, they're all the same charge, so they're going to repel one another, right? So in order to get the lowest possible energy available, the most stable, low energy means stable, the most stable, then you would want to keep these in separate orbitals until you had to pair them up. Right? If you're forced to pair them up, then okay, we'll do it. Okay, those are uh, three principles. Um, what this slide is trying to show is that that the first number on the left, the principal quantum number, the n number, one, two, three, four, five, that is essentially the the uh, energy bracket. I would I would say not the absolute energy level, but the energy bracket. Um, and then the subshell derived from that are the SPDs and Fs. We don't have any Fs in this one. But what it's saying is that as you add more electrons, these uh, subshells, they tend to swap places. And it, it has to do with the interaction of multiple electrons. So the one thing about the Bohr model, remember the planetary model? The only element that it worked for was hydrogen because it only had one electron. It didn't have electron interactions that had to be dealt with. Right? So it worked for one electron or uh, hydrogen, hydrogen-like um, atoms. So it would work for hydrogen as a neutral atom, but it would only work for helium if helium were a plus one charge. Right? That means it only has one electron because right? helium has two, two protons, two electrons. So with a plus one charge, now you've only got one electron and you can, and the, the Bohr model will work for helium plus or lithium two plus because it is a one electron. So when you start getting these interactions between electrons, then you get, you get energy levels to switch places. And that's what we're showing here. Um, let's see, the first place it's significant is when you get up to that uh, uh, right here, 4S and 3D, they swap places. And that's why when we're building, building our atoms, one proton, one electron at a time, when you get to that point where you need a D, 3D and a 4S orbital, then they're going to be swapped. Okay. So how do we deal with that? Well, there's a, there's a, a neat little trick. I think it's on the next slide. Here it is. It's a, it's my, it's a diagonal map. So let me get rid of this stuff right here. Maybe it'll race better. Yeah, might as well erase that. Test my memory. All right. So if you draw the orbitals, you know that the if the principal quantum number is one, there's only one possible subshell for it. Yes, that's it. Right, right? because uh, n would be this, l would be would be one, l would be zero. That's as far as you can go. Right. If you go to two, then you can have an s and a, a p, right? Because uh, you could go zero and one. And zero is S and one is P. Okay, everybody following me so far? Okay, and if you go three, you can have S, P, 
P and D. And if you go four, you can have S, P, D, and F. And you can keep going. So what we do is we take the diagonal, right? We fill this one first. This one, how, how many electrons can we put in this one? Two, just two. Okay. So we go through that one, and then we circle back, and we go through this one. Circle back and go through this one, right? 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s. Those, so far, they're in, in energy order. One, two, three. I'm sorry? Can you move the camera a little bit so that you can fully see what you're doing like that? There was a part that was being cut off of what you were driving. Is that cut off? Uh, my, my thing says it's all on camera. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, that's why I'm standing off camera so that I don't block it. But now, uh, 3s, and then you can go to 3p, and you get 3p. Then you go to 4s, not 3d. 4s. Then you go back to 3d, and then 4p, uh, and then. On and on. Okay. So that's one way to get them in the right uh, energy order to to uh, obey um, the alphabet principle. Actually, there's an e easier way. Once you know how the periodic table is structured, you don't need this. So we're going to build an atom or two. So the electron configuration is a statement of the structure of the uh, electrons around an atom based upon how many protons they have and the associated electrons that, cut, that give you a neutral atom. Uh, and there's a shorthand way to do it. And that's, that's one of the reasons that we came up with this SPTF, so that you wouldn't have like a, a four zero and four one and Four two and four three, that that's just begging for mistakes. So if we use these um, letter increments, so that we can write the shorthand, and the shorthand would be, if you want to build an atom, this one comes first, then this one, then this one, then that one, then that one, and then this one, then this one. <laughs> And then this one, uh, and then I think 5s would be down here, and then 4d, and so forth. So that would be the order, energy order from left to right. And then however many electrons we are allowed, we can start filling them in. Okay. <laughs> if we're allowed, say, I don't know, 20 electrons, which, what would that be? That would be calcium. Right. If calcium is 20 electrons, then this can only hold two. We've got to fill it up before we can move higher. This one would hold two. How many does this P hold? Three times two is six. Six, then two, then six. Let's see how many I've got so far. Six and four is ten. Uh, so that's eight, nine, ten. So that's all you need for calcium right there. Okay. Notice, look way out here. 4s, two electrons. Look at the periods. Period one is hydrogen and helium. Period two is lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, all the way up to neon. Period three is sodium over to argon. Period four is potassium, calcium. Period four. Okay. Um, when you get to the D's, then things change a little bit, and, and it's best explained with an example. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, we're using nitrogen as, as an example here. This is known as the condensed notation. So nitrogen would have uh, two or seven, seven electrons. Does it? 
Yeah. Its atomic number is seven. So it has seven electrons that have to be placed in their shells. And we we would only need this one, this one, and that one. But this one is not completely filled. It only goes up to three. Okay? So if we were to draw this out, if we were to expand this, P's have three orbitals in them. This is a subshell. These are orbitals. So where would those elect electrons go in nitrogen? Let's see. This were three. Let's do that. And let's say that's nitrogen. Okay, so we need three here, right? So if we were asked to draw the orbitals for this one, you would have an electron here, here, and here. Okay. I'm sorry? Oh, for all the P orbitals? It depends on how many electrons there are. You, yeah, all the P's have three sub have three orbitals in the subshell. So this one would have three, that one would have three. We could draw five for this one, put five lines under there. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Right, yeah, it's consistent. Uh, if it's a P, it's got three. If it's a D, it's got five. If it's an F, it's got seven. Yep. Um, so what if we went to oxygen? Oxygen's right next door. It has eight. Right. So if we have eight for oxygen, that means we would add one more here, wouldn't it? Four, five, six, seven, eight. That means three, and we need one more. So that pairs them. Okay. All right. Um, the creators of this uh, slide set like uh, the uh, double barb arrows up and down like that. I find it easier to write single barbs. And instead of boxes, I just use lines. Okay, so don't let that confuse you. All right. Let's try sulfur. Okay, let's erase all this and get rid of that and keep our order here. It's the same order. And now we've got space for space for sulfur. All right. So sulfur has how many electrons in the neutral atom? 16. Right. Okay. So we can put 2, 4, 6 is 10, and 2, and 6 is 8 more. Oops, that's too many, isn't it? So uh, that's 10, 11, 12, and four more right here. So that would be sulfur. Notice this is the um, the valence shell is the one with the same principal quantum number. So this is the valence shell. It has six electrons. So sulfur should be Roman numeral six. Right? If we look at that chart, sure it is. Roman numeral 6A. That's where it comes from. Six. But these are already filled. So once we get into that right-hand section, you're counting in the P's. So if you count from aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, you've got a P4. Which P4? Well, which period is it in? Right? Hydrogen, lithium, sodium. That's it. Three. It's in period three. So it's 3P4. You can read that off the table if you know the way the table is structured. Okay. So there you go. Barium is another story. Barium is a huge atom with lots of electrons. So, we don't just have a condensed notation. We have a um, uh, an abbreviated condensed notation. <laughs> Um, well, let's do it the hard way first. Barium is 56, right? Barium. 56. So it's 2, 2, 6, 2, 6, 2, 10. Right? 5 times 2 is 10. And 6. And 2. 
let's see how many we've got so far. It's four plus six is 10. And two, two, there's another 10. There's 20, 30, 36, 37, 38, 38, 48. Okay, 48. So what comes next? 4D goes 5P. We'd have six more. And then we swing around to 6S2. That should be 56. Let's see. Uh, 2 plus 6, that's 10. That's 10 more. 10 more, that's 30. 40. 48, 49, 50, 56. So when you set it up, it's S, S, P. So how do you Where? know the letters to you? Set up here? Yeah. Oh. Is there a specific order that like you, uh -huh. know, like it's S, S, P, P, S, for, for this? P, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's based upon this zigzag. Okay. Yeah. It's based upon that zigzag because this um, device, this learning device, whatever, uh, takes into account the change in the energy levels with multiple electrons. Mm, okay. uh, instead of going, um, let's see, 3s, 3p, 3d, and then 4s, 4p, 4d, it, you get swaps in here. Because of the electron interactions, you get um, 4s is a lower energy than a 3d. Okay. And this takes that into account so that you don't have to you don't have to know how they got there. But if you know how the periodic table is structured, you can recreate this. All right? Um, you're going to fill um, uh, 1s1. This is 1s2. This is 2s1, 2s2, 3p, not 2p. One, two, three, four, five, six, two P six. And you go down here. Now when you get to these, this is four S one, four S two. When you get to the D orbitals, you back up one. So this period has four. This is a three D one. Okay. These go backwards there until you get to this side, then you go back up to four. Four P. Then you go to five S. This is four D. And this is 5p. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the time. No, oh, that's that's what I'm here for. Uh, okay, so the abbreviated, um, the abbreviated condensed notation <laughs> takes into account the fact that you've gone through periods where you've crossed through a noble gas. Noble gases are complete. In other words, we would get to a noble gas uh, here with, right here with uh, 10 right there. This one would designate neon. And then if we went through uh, 3s, 3p6, we had eight more. Then this one would designate uh, argon. And then if we went further, down to uh, 4p, this, that adds 18 more. 18, 18 is 36. That's krypton. Okay. So this is 10, this is 18, this is 36. And what do we have left? Well, let's see. Krypton, and then we can go through to xenon. So xenon would be out to here, right? 5p6 is on xenon is where xenon is located. So we go like that, and xenon is made up of everything here all the way out to that one. And let's see, we've added uh, 18 more, right? So what is it, 54? Yeah, 54. 54. Okay, the um, abbreviated condensed notation takes this into account. This is going to be the same. Anything beyond xenon is going to have this core. Okay. So what we're going to say is this is the same as saying xenon 
with its 54. And then what's left over? 6s2. That's barium. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's a lot simpler. I think, let's see. Yeah, there's the hard way. And then here's the short, the shorthand uh, abbreviated notation. So what we've been trying to do is develop a system where we can build atoms so that we can use them because we know that the valence electrons are, for this one, would be in the threes, right? So neon has eight, but it's perfectly filled. That's why, that's why these noble gases don't react with anything because they don't have any empty orbitals. Right? If we back up one, from neon, you got fluorine. And how many electrons does fluorine need, need in this orbital to make it look like neon, electronically speaking? Just one electron. Right. So if we take fluorine at nine, and we add an electron, that looks like neon, electronically. That's why it's happy. If it's got one electron, now it's got you got six electrons in that top orbital. You know, that's what drives reactions is completing those orbitals. So all of the halogens are that way. All the halogens have one shy of being full uh, uh, noble gas orbitals. Whereas, um, let's see, sodium has 11. And where does it go? Well, sodium has one electron in that orbital right there. And it goes out to here, and has one in that orbital. So what's the easiest way for it to look like neon? Just kick that electron out. Right. Make a positive ion. Now it has one extra proton than electrons. Gives it a positive one charge. That's why all the alkali metals have a valence of one, and their charge preference is plus one. Because all they got to do is get rid of one electron and they look like a noble gas. So everybody's trying to look like noble gases. <laughs> or inert gases. They're really not that noble. They just, they don't play well with others. Okay. Uh, so let me see. I got till one o'clock on it. Except we need to talk about... Um, we need to get to the lab, which is uh, graphing, right? Yeah. Okay. I got to save enough time for graphing. So let me see if I'm anywhere near being done. <laughs> Not too far. Okay. Not too far. And I've talked about a lot of stuff now that's going to be in the, the upcoming slides. I've already talked about it, so we'll just kind of blend it together. Sodium configuration. We talked about sodium already. Uh, it's going to have a 4s1. Uh, excuse me. Um, two, four, no, 3s1. Excuse me. 3s1. Right. Two, four. Oh, I was looking at the wrong one. I'm sorry. Uh, this one's for fluorine. Uh, it has 2, 4, and 5 is 9. So fluorine associates with this one. And sodium associates with this one. My mistake. So that means that, excuse me, that uh, 3s1 would be uh, sodium's configuration. Uh, so like I said, that electronic configuration in the outermost shell is similar for every member of a group. That's why they behave similarly. All right, so here's an example. The 1A group, lithium, sodium, potassium, they all have S orbitals with only one electron in the outermost orbital. So the easiest way to look like a noble gas is just kick that electron out. Okay. So this explains what I've shown before. Uh, S orbitals are being filled. The thing about the... Uh, 
that scenario is that S orbitals are being filled not only for um, hydrogen and the two left columns, but also helium. We stick helium on the right hand side for balance and because it's a noble gas. Right. But the S orbital is what's being uh, dealt with in helium also. And of course, the transition metals are D's. The six right hand columns are P's and the lanthanides and actinides on the bottom are F orbitals. Now, I'm not sure why we threw this one in here. I don't talk about it much. The distinguishing electron is the last electron added to the configuration for an element. And it has the highest energy of the neutral atom, the last electron to go in. All right. Thales electrons are associated with those electrons that are at the same principal quantum number. So this one would have eight. Uh, neon would have eight valence electrons, whereas um, fluorine would only have seven. Right? You have two here, seven here makes nine. So it has that many valence electrons. Uh, let's see. Classification system. Uh, so we talked about this already. Repres uh, this does make a reference to the representative elements right there. And the representatives are the left two columns and the rights. Uh, actually, the right. I guess you can include noble gases, but we typically, because they don't react, we typically uh, include the columns with boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine and leave the noble gases out because they don't react. So those are the representative elements. Don't ask me where that name came from. Doesn't make any sense to me either. Okay, there's organizational based upon that previous slide. Elements in group one and two are referred to as S, S area, right? We're filling S orbitals in those two. Oh, concept questions. That means we're, we're at the end, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got time. So let me, I'm going to leave that arrangement there, but I'm going to erase all this peripheral stuff in case we need it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, consider two elements. One is a gas and the other is a solid. Okay. So the gas would, would have to be a uh, nonmetal. And the solid could be either. Each contain identical number of electrons in their outer shell. These elements are identical numbers in their outer shell. That means that they would have to come from the same group if they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. They don't have to have the same number of total electrons, just the same number in their outer shell. That gives them the same chemical behavior. OK, so um, let's see if we can eliminate some of them before we go to the next condition, like fluorine and iodine. Yeah, fluorine and iodine have the same number in their outer shell. They're in the same group. OK. So A is a possibility. How about nitrogen and sulfur? No, they're in two different groups. So B is out. Uh, how about oxygen and sulfur? Yeah, that's possible, right? They're in the same group. Fluorine and iodine again. So we only threw out B based upon that first condition. And they contain something and something neutrons respectively. Okay, so now we have to say, how many neutrons does each one contain? This gets a little tricky because we didn't tell you what isotope it was. So we have to assume from the mass, the atomic mass, which is the dominant isotope. And you can usually figure that one out. All right. How about fluorine and iodine? Okay. 
let's do uh, let's do a fluorine and iodine fluorine's nine here and iodine is uh 53. okay what's the most common isotope for fluorine well let's look at the uh, mass number of the atomic mass 18.998 the most common is probably 19. And there's a, a minor one that drags it down just a little bit into 18 territory. So 19 is probably the most common. How about iodine? All right, let's look at iodine. Its atomic mass is 126.9. So its most common is probably 127. Okay. How many neutrons does that give this one? Ten. It gives this one four, uh, 74, right? I did my math right. So does A, 10 and 74? A works. Yeah, A works. So test taking technique. If you've got answers and you don't have any squirrely ones like uh, two of the above none of the above all that kind of garbage if they're just just straight answers then you can work your way down and when you get the right answer stop move on to the next question all right then you, you decrease anxiety and, and time spent on the test okay so that was question one question two you're asked to determine the composition of a gas. There are three components with three different applications. They all have the same atomic number. Three components. I would just say three elements, wouldn't you? Right. Based on the answers. Uh, with three different applications. They all have the same atomic number, but the number of neutrons is zero. Same atomic number. The number of neutrons is zero? One and two. Ah, zero, one, and two. So what's the only element that has zero neutrons? Oh, excuse me. One. Right? One plus zero is one. So that's, I forget what they call this, this particular isotope. All I can remember is, is this one with one neutron would be two there and two neutrons would be three there, right? This one has no neutrons, one neutron, two neutrons. This is deuterium, this is tritium. I don't remember what they call that one. Um, they all have the same, let's see, one of the components is used as a radioactive tracer in biological experiments. It's probably tritium because it is radioactive. I don't think deuterium is. Identify the gas you were given. How are the three components referred in the name of each component? Well, they're all hydrogen. Oh, okay, protium. There it is. <laughs> protium is the, is the most common one. So they're isotopes. Hydrogen isotopes, B looks good. Protium, deuterium, tritium. I think B is probably a good answer. They're not individual elements. They're isotopes of the same element. Okay. I like to remember that one. Protium. Okay, that's it.